Good afternoon. I'm Karen Garvin, Chair of the Program Committee of Beacon Hill Village. And thank you for coming to Demystifying Technology, a joint venture of Beacon Hill Village's Charlie Davidson and the Vilna Schulz Lynn Krosker Schultz. These two will give us some definition to the technology we are dealing with today. You may ask questions via the Q&A box and our presenters will address them at the end of the session. First, a little bit about Beacon Hill Village, a nonprofit organization in Boston that believes we all have choices as we grow older, and then a video describing the Vilna Shul. The village movement began in 1999 when a group of friends and neighbors in Beacon Hill met and thought about their future as they aged. They wanted to avoid challenges their parents and friends had faced, keep control of their lives and design their own futures, make informed choices and decisions about where and how they live, create their own solutions, and enjoy new ways to thrive in the new phase of their life. Their vision was a virtual vi village, a community led by older adults who share their skills, support, and expertise with each other to navigate the challenges and opportunities of aging. Beacon Hill Village was incorporated in April 2001 and began operations in January 2002. Shortly, we will celebrate our 20th anniversary. And we will note right here that Beacon Hill Village was the first village in this country and now there are over 350 villages throughout this country and some around the world. While the pandemic caused us to reinvent ourselves, Beacon Hill Village remains focused on its founding principles. We are member driven with vibrant programs and member led interest groups. We address the mind, the body, and the spirit through speaker series, discussion groups, fitness classes, meditation, and we keep in touch with our members via a phone tree. We've partnered with King's Chapel here on Beacon Hill, the Boston Public Library with our Living Well, Ending Well series, Recently with Little Brothers, Friends of the Elderly, whose students are working with us on intergenerational games and now working with us in some ways for assisting people to get vaccination slots. And most recently with the Vilna Schule, where we are starting with this program and will continue to work with the Vilna Schule for others. We look different today, but we are connecting and staying active. In March, we had to make the decision to pivot from our regular person-to-person -person, uh, programs to virtual programs. On this slide, you can see us before COVID celebrating our birthdays, staying fit with exercise classes in various locations around Boston and engaging with members in many different ways. Now we still celebrate birthdays, but we do it on the, um, we do it on um, Zoom. We have exercise classes and meditation and yoga classes on Zoom. And we engage with our members on Zoom many times a week. So I want to thank you for listening to us and uh, listening to me and learning a little bit about Beacon Hill Village. And now uh, we will have the, um, a very interesting video about the Vilna Schule. Lynn?
I should be. Uh... Mm -hmm. I think I'm on. Uh, my name is Evan Chainments, and I've been asked, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to welcome the attendees of this joint tech competency event on behalf of the Vilna Shul. Our partner, Beacon Hill Village, you've just heard a great deal about the wonderful organization and the source of new friends for me. Um, and uh, the Beacon Hill Village and the Vilna Shul have, share a recognition of the fact that the new virtual world requires seniors to be competent in using uh, virtual tools. And having just completed the extensive and expensive remodeling, which you just saw on the video, uh, gave you a taste of what was happening for a year when the building closed uh, in order to achieve one of its main goals and that was making space that was usable and attractive and available to the community for many, many purposes and uses and also and expanding its space. Uh, that was one of the earliest goals of the uh, now secular Vilna Shul. And uh, you saw a bit of that and you can just imagine the rest. Um, Unfortunately, what happened, uh, just as it was ready to reopen, the end of 2019, and we were lining up very interesting programming and getting our community groups together in the building after having been closed for renovations. A few months later, uh, COVID-19 closed us. And uh, that led to the, I think, remarkably interesting virtual programming um, that you just saw a tiny sample of um, by the Vilna Shul. But um, to say the least, we were very sad to have closed and are eagerly hoping um, to see you soon and that this horrible situation will have ended. But since we're here to get a grip on tech, I decided to leave the historical details of the Vilna Schulz congregation, um, immigrant congregation, uh, one of the last remaining ones opened in the city of Boston. And, um, its closure due to uh, change demographics, uh, reducing the congregation to one person, um, a long-term litigation, and then a really wonderful reopening as a secular uh, community-based, community-oriented uh, institution, eager to welcome um, new, um, new members of our community, our larger community, our foreign community. Everybody spoke at the Vilna Shul, everybody of all sorts had programming. We had cultural programming, art programming, musical programming, uh, Jewish oriented programming and all kinds of programming. And um, many of you, um, have already been to the Vilna Shul and we're very anxious to have you back as soon as possible. Uh, so at this point, having delegated uh, historic details to uh, the cloud, um, I'm very honored to introduce to you somebody most of you know, uh, that's Charlie Davidson, the uh, marvelous uh, volunteer a uh, guru of the Beacon Hill Village, a member with his wife Elaine since 2009, and currently a board member. Um, because of his computer uh, cumin, 
Uh, he was instrumental in helping Beacon Hill Village um, become virtual. So he is combining his skills with the uh, skills of Lynn Schultz, uh, the programming director and um, outreach coordinator and de facto tech person to bring all of our uh, skills, um, make all of our skills happen. And uh, we're waiting um, very, very eagerly for their input. So thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you, Charlie and Lynn for helping us learn. Bye. Thank you so much, Eva Jean. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're thrilled to join you. Um, we're going to go over three main topics today. Um, Charlie is at first going to set out a couple of definitions and define some terms so that we are all on the same page. We'll then jump into social media, what that means and different types of social media. From there, we'll talk a little bit about video chatting and what that means. And from there, we'll go to streaming. So we have a very ambitious agenda and lots to cover and not a lot of time. So without further ado, Charlie, I'm going to throw it to you so that you can define some terms. Okay, uh, one of the things we wanna do is that uh, we wanna make sure you ask questions because that will make it much more formative for you and much easier for us because otherwise we'll just have to jabber. Uh, so uh, there's a Q&A box to ask your questions and uh, that's the way you should do it since you're all muted, you won't be able to do it any other way. Um, so uh, what we're gonna cover, we've already talked about the topics and how we're gonna cover it. It's really gonna be someplace between uh, how to connect your printer and world hunger. We're sort of looking at the, the sweet spot between those. Um, so, uh, and so, some of you might want to know how to uh, connect your printer. Um, there's always the number of support options. You know, there's ways to get support. It's much like if you had a plumbing problem. You can do it yourself. You can uh, Google how to use the wrench. Uh, you can, uh, there's YouTube that has a lot of helpful sites and sometimes not very helpful sites. Uh, they're friends, there's in-laws, the grandchildren. There's professionals, you know, you know them all or they will, they will come to you. And if you're a member of the village, you can call the office and we have some people that'll help you. Um, one of the things we want to talk about, one of the things that sort of a, that gets all this around this is the term apps. What is an app? Where does it come from? What do, what do, what do they do? Um, they, it comes from a, it's a corruption of the term application is what it is. And I think Steve Jobs said when he was doing his cutie thing on his phone, he didn't want to call it applications. So we called it apps, so they'd be different. Uh, and they tend to be, they tended, well, it, it's become a marketing term now, so it's been a little vague, but they're what you need to do. They can do anything from like you have a cell phone, an app can turn on the flashlight function for you. It can also uh, be your browser. It can be your email, will be an app. Um, Word, Microsoft has made Word an app. So apps are just a little bit of programming that makes your device functional. You get them from um, the app store. In uh, Microsoft has an app store. In Apple, uh, it is the uh, Apple store, I believe. Uh, and in Android, it's um, the Google Play Store. Google Play Store, you know, and it's and you search like anything else, and it's you just and you download them and you say I want to install it and you do it. They do take up space every once in a while when you on your phone you'll install the other app and everything will stop working because you've overloaded your phone, and then you've got to get rid of something. Um, so that's what an app is. Um, and now uh, we're gonna let uh, Wendy, cause she knows a lot more about social media than I do cause I'm not very social. So Wendy's gonna talk about social media. Hi everyone. I'm gonna share my screen for just a moment um, just to give you a slide. So we often, or I am often asked, what is social media? Is this social media or is that social media? 
So social media is basically a way of conveying your thoughts, ideas, information, your personal information through a variety of networks online. Um, so social media, you typically can follow friends or family. They can follow you back. And it's a way of exchanging information, basically. Examples of social media apps, and we'll go through a couple different of ones of these to figure out you know, what's right for you, what you should be using. You don't have to be on all of them. You don't have to be on any of them. Um, you can get sucked down the social media rabbit hole and spend hours upon hours surfing social media, just like you can spend hours upon hours of um, watching TV, right? It's a little bit mindless. Um, and you want to take everything that you read on social media, especially if it's news content, with a grain of salt. Um, you know, seeing pictures of your grandkids or your friend's grandkids or what they're doing, that's lovely. And that's kind of the purpose of social media. So Facebook is perhaps the most um, widely used, um, especially with your age demographic, um, age demographic being above the age of 40 right now. Um, and um, it is a way to converse and follow your friends and family. Um, you can do videos, you can do pictures, you can do anything and everything on Facebook, which is really nice. You can repost articles. Instagram is a new one that just came out um, probably a few years ago. It's a picture-based um, social media. So in order to post something, you have to have a picture, which is really interesting. Um, and so that's just a different way of following. Um, Twitter, another one you've probably all heard of. Twitter is 140 characters or less. That's what they're known for. So you have to phrase your thought in 140 characters or less. I find Twitter very useful in following um, thought leaders and people who I want to learn from, um, whether they be heads of institutions or educational organizations or nonprofits. Um, there are some really interesting debates uh, that are framed on Twitter and it's very, very interesting to follow some of the people. TikTok is a video-based social media app. And so people make videos, they, uh, they're short videos, they're 120 seconds or less, they put them to songs. A lot of them are pop culture songs and hip hop songs. Um, it's everything from dancing to saying why you like stuff and you don't like stuff. Um, and many of you are probably familiar with YouTube, which is the last one. Um, and YouTube has a variety of um, of videos that you can watch. You can subscribe to specific YouTube channels. One of my favorites is National Geographic, um, has a fabulous YouTube channel that has lots and lots of um, different um, things that they post about different animals and what they're following, which is really nice. Um, the Vilna has their own social, uh, their own YouTube channel where you can see all of our free um, videos and programs that we've done. In fact, this video will be posted on our YouTube page afterwards. And when you subscribe to uh, a YouTube page, um, you'll get an alert when something new is posted, which is really nice. Um, so those are kind of some of the different and most popular social media apps. If you have questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A and we can ask more, we can answer more specifics about them. Um, and we are happy to move on to um, video chatting. Okay. Um, one of the things I, I, I like to add about social media is that um, it's paid for by the fact that you give it your information. Mm -hmm. So you should be careful what kind of information you give. Uh, and there are privacy settings you can set. Some of them are somewhat arcane to navigate uh, because they, we don't want you to set your privacy settings. Um, and uh, so think about it you know talk to some people if you if you end up doing but you know if you on facebook i only look at get notifications when some some of the people i follow have put up pictures so i don't care what my privacy settings is because i don't do anything but if you're very active and doing a lot of things these all have become corporate sites and that's how they make their money so that's just a word to the wise um, should also, sorry, before you continue, Charlie, do not follow or accept friend invitations from anyone you don't know. Okay, there are lots of strangers who are trying to get your information or trying to take your pictures and use them for other purposes. Only be friends, only follow, only engage with those people that you actually know in real life. Um, so that's one thing. Eileen is asking, what's the cost of YouTube membership? 
Um, so Eileen, there's a couple different, and then we'll jump to video chatting. There's a couple different levels of YouTube. Um, I'll say I only use the free one, to be honest. Uh, it's totally fine for my purposes. YouTube has a variety of different things where you can, and we'll talk about streaming in a second, but they have a streaming service that costs money. If you want to just view videos that people are posting like National Geographic or like the Vilna, you don't need a membership and you don't need to pay. It's really if you want to stream TV shows that you need to pay for one of their services. On to video chatting. Okay. Um, video chatting is, is actually, that it's a, it's a compared to, uh, Social media, video chatting is very straightforward. Um, it's uh, all, uh, well, I say I used to work for the phone company, so we'd call it, we used to call it picture phone, but uh, that's that's a historical fact. Um, what you need to do uh, a, uh, to do video chat is something that, some, some hardware. You need hardware that has a camera that you can, a front facing camera, so you, you can have, you, you can see yourself. Um, and they can see you. You need a microphone to talk into, and uh, you need a camera and a screen. So I think that's four things. I screwed that up. But anyway, there are various services. Um, oh, by the way, all your smartphones all have, all the smartphones have all this equipment you need. Most laptops that were released within the last 10 years has everything you need. So hardware is a pretty small, it's not much of a hurdle. Um, there are plenty of services and there really is not much difference between any of them. I mean, there's FaceTime, Zoom, uh, Duo, WhatsApp, Google Meet, and there's Skype, you know, there's all sorts of things. Some of the, most of them are free. Um, Skype is, you know, well, Skype, Skype isn't necessarily free, but there are all these services. But what's important in, in, the, in the video chat services is um, who you want to talk to. If your grandkids are on FaceTime, uh, that's what you have to be on. If you're, they're on, you know, if your, your service organization is doing Zoom, you want to be on Zoom. So it's really um, when you decide which one you're going to use, it's... Um, who are you going to talk to? And that's really all there is to know about. Uh, I wrote some notes here. Yeah. I'll jump in and say it also depends a little bit on what your devices are. If you are on an Android phone and your grandkids are on an Apple phone, you cannot FaceTime with them. FaceTime is an Apple specific and Apple unique app. You cannot get that on a Google phone or an Android phone. So you would have to choose something else to video talk with them, whether it be Duo or WhatsApp or Zoom or one of the variety of other things. Um, so there are apps that are made specifically for Apple products. It's why Apple has such a um, unique niche within the market because their apps are made only for their products. We should also say that like Charlie said, there are a zillion apps for everything you want to do. If you want to shop online, there's literally a million apps that will allow you to shop online. You want to turn on the flashlight on your phone, there's going to be a hundreds upon hundreds of those in your Apple Play, in your Apple Store or your Google Play Store. Um, so you just need to figure out by reading the reviews um, and seeing which ones work for you. Just because it works great for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work great for you. Someone else may love Chevrolet cars. You might like BMWs, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just what you prefer and you have to, it's a little bit of trial and error um, to figure out what works best for you and what you're trying to do. Anything else on video chats, Charlie? Uh, let's see, we had someone who asked about uh, charging. Almost all these services are free. I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of amazing, but they're almost all free. Uh, Skype has some charges to it, but for the most part, you can call around the world for nothing. It's ruined. I used to work for the phone company. It's ruined our business. <laughs> um, people tend to prefer the WhatsApp function or the WhatsApp app um, for international calls. So if you're trying to reach people in Israel or the UK or wherever, that tends to be the most used international um, app for making international calls and international texts. Um, you know. 
If you want to use uh, Duo, I will say is really useful if you're going from Android to Apple. So for example, my kids like to call their grandparents who are on Apple devices, we use Duo because that is a platform and an application that can be used on both phones and allow us to chat um, with each other, even though I'm on an Android and they're on an Apple. Um, keep the questions coming. We will answer them as they come along. And in the meantime, we're gonna talk about streaming. Um, so we get lots of questions. Um, and even when we were in the planning calls, figuring out what we were going to talk about um, and how we we're going to frame this conversation about what is exactly streaming. It's this term that's used all the time now. What does it actually mean? All streaming is a method of transmitting or receiving data over a computer network in a steady, continuous way. So it's watching a TV show on your computer or your phone or your iPad. It's watching a YouTube video on your computer or your phone or your iPad. Um, if you have a smart TV, and we'll talk a little bit about what a smart TV is in a, sec in a second, it's about putting an app on your smart TV and playing um, a video through that. That's all streaming is. Um, so if you have ever watched a video on your computer or on your phone, you have successfully streamed before. Things like Facebook, things like Zoom, things like WhatsApp are not streaming because you're not um, watching something. You're talking with someone, you're engaging. Um, another important thing about streaming is you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can fast forward it, which is really nice, right? It's kind of like the old school uh, VCRs, but on your computer, um, which is great. So there's a whole variety of ways of how to stream. Okay. There are devices that you can plug into your computer and plug into your TV that will help you stream. And we'll go over those in just a second. But the key to streaming is having these apps. And there's a variety of apps that will let you stream. And it all depends on what content you want. So if you think about um, back in the old days when you cable first came out and you had to choose what you wanted, some people subscribed to HBO and some people didn't, right? If you subscribe to HBO, you could watch The Sopranos. If you didn't subscribe to HBO, you couldn't watch The Sopranos, right? Pretty simple. Same thing. So now HBO has a streaming device, HBO Max. So you don't have to subscribe to HBO with your cable company. You can subscribe to HBO Max through whatever your streaming device is um, or on your computer and watch all of the content that HBO has. And of course, HBO is producing um, unique content, content that you can only watch on their channel like The Sopranos, right? You couldn't watch that anyplace else. Same thing with Netflix. Netflix is another way to stream. Um, and Netflix produces a whole variety of shows that you can only watch on Netflix. You're not gonna get them on Comcast. You're not gonna get them on TV. You're not gonna get them on um, anything else except the Netflix platform. Um, a couple of other different types of streaming platforms just to list them so you're aware. YouTube has a streaming platform. A lot of people these days are ditching cable and subscribing to YouTube TV, which is basically um, streaming TV shows that are live. So, you, you know, you can watch them in live time um, and uh, it's really nice. Hulu is another one. Again, creating unique content. Amazon Prime is another one. Um, Peacock is another one. Apple TV is another one. Um, and so each unique app has its own content and what you need to figure out is what do you want to watch, right? What's important to you? If you subscribe to regular cable, you might not need the Peacock app because you have all of the shows that they're going to give you anyways through um, your regular cable. If you don't subscribe to HBO and say your cable company is charging you 30 bucks a month to subscribe to HBO, but HBO Max, the streaming app, is only $10 a month, I'm making these numbers up. I don't know the real prices off the top of my head, but it might be more cost efficient for you to just subscribe to the streaming app versus through your um, through your cable provider. Um, and so it really is what you want. Um, you've probably heard of um, some different shows that people are creating. HBO Max did a great series called The Flight Attendant. Again, you can only watch that on HBO Max. Hulu did a fantastic mini series based on the book, Little Fires Everywhere. Again, you can only watch that on Hulu. So how do you get these streaming apps, right? One is on your computer or your iPad. You download them through your Apple Play Store or your Google, uh, I'm sorry, your Apple Store or your Google Play Store. And when you open them, it'll bring you through a signup process. You'll put a credit card on file. It'll charge you usually a monthly fee. If you pay for a year in advance, it usually gives you a slight discount. Not all of them have that deal, but a lot of them do. Um, 
Disney, for example, just came out with uh, their own streaming app. If you have little kids or grandkids, like it's great for that. And you can pay for one year, two years, or five years. They've gone up to five years now and save money if you subscribe to five years. So um, you can do that. If you have a relatively new TV, I'd say in the last five to seven years, there are devices you can buy to plug into your TV. Um, and I'll share my screen just to show you a device um, that you can see. And so maybe. All right, so you can see down in this corner, the streaming devices, two of the most popular ones are Roku um, and Amazon Fire Stick. Um, and they basically, um, they basically are a little gadget that you plug into the back of your TV and then there's a special remote for it. And this gadget will allow you to download apps like Netflix, HBO Max, Peacock, Hulu, all of those apps we just talked about. And once they are downloaded, you can then use your TV and use the apps on your TV. Um, and it would be great. You know, you can watch all of this content on your TV. Um, certain apps like Netflix charge per device. So you pay X amount, you know, say $15 a month for one device. If you want to put it on your computer and your TV, you're paying $25 a month. If you're, you know, so the number of devices you're putting it on is how they charge. And again, it's app specific. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple of the questions um, and keep the questions coming. Uh, Judith asks, with all these streaming devices, how do you decide which one? I like pieces offered by many of them. It all takes research, Judith. That's the hard part, right? It's like you like these two shows on Netflix and you like this one show on HBO Max and you like these five shows on Hulu. You have to figure out what your budget is and what you can subscribe to um, and what it's going to cost you. Um, you know, uh, go ahead, Charlie. Um, for the most part, the device does not matter. If you buy, there's... I divide it in a couple of things. Um, to, to stream, you need an internet connection on your device. Um, and that, I mean, a smart TV is, has a built-in internet connection. Uh, Roku and uh, Fire Stick from Prime, all these devices plug into the back of your TV and provide you with an internet connection. Both all these devices then create what they have, what I would call an operating system. So, and so it tells you, you know, it's sort of like, if you think of it as a smartphone, it, it tells you, okay, this is where you're going to put your apps, which is what you really want to get to. So if I want to do uh, HBO uh, and I'm on a, a Roku, I go out to the Roku store or their app, wherever they say, wherever you get your apps for Roku, and there'll be a place, and you install HBO on your Roku device, and then you can HBO. Um, and then, of course, you have to subscribe to HBO because getting the app only allows you to get the screen, get the stream. If you don't pay for it, they won't send it to you. Um, so it really doesn't. It, you know, it's it's a price thing. For the most part, they're all new. I think for the things are going to be, if you're a prime customer, for example, the Fire Stick's good because you're into the prime environment and all the stuff you get with Amazon, and they already know everything about you already, so you won't be telling them anything new. Um, uh, Roku does the same thing. You know, if, if you don't have anything. Uh, audio smart TVs, you know, you end up really with the Samsung operating system. Uh, but that's just the place you get your apps from. You then go buy your apps and it's the apps you watch you stream through. So it doesn't matter really what you buy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, do you have Locus in your area? It's a free app for live TV. I have not heard of that one and I'm not aware of it. Um, Charlie, do you know anything about that? No. No. Okay. So we don't know, but again, these are all, these are, this conversation is being used as a way to give you ideas and for you to start your exploration of how to use current technology to further your education, your learning and your entertainment. So um, we welcome you to do that. Um, Joan says, I just bought a TV 
and I cut the cord on table on cable. Congratulations, Joan. It's a hard thing to do. I think I can mirror my phone so I can watch TV shows on my TV instead of my computer. Um, yes, there are some apps that you can download. Um, if you have an Apple phone and an Apple TV, you very easily can mirror um, Apple products to Apple products um, through their mirror app. Um, but again, we it's hard to troubleshoot you specifically um, since we don't have your technology, but you can do that in some situations um, without too much trouble. Uh, Joan, uh, I would uh, call the office. That's a sort of a, a sort of a connect the printer kind of question. Um, there's some questions about if you install on one device, are you limited to viewing on that one device? And the answer is, um, it depends on the app, to be honest. You know, Netflix, you pay by device. So if you download it on your phone and you want to watch it on your TV, you need to upgrade to a plan that allows you, which costs more money, to allow you to view on two devices. So it just depends on, um, you know, your budget and what you're hoping to do. Um, you know, the other thing that we probably shouldn't say, but we're going to say, is that if you have a good network of friends or family, you can share devices, right? Or share apps. So for example, my sister-in-law who is in California, she pays the Netflix subscription. We have the username and password. I pay the Amazon Prime subscription. She has my username and password. And we go back and forth because we both agreed that having two, it was cheaper to put two devices on each app than it was for us each to subscribe separately. So it depends on who you know. Is that against the rules? Probably, not gonna lie. But you know, we're, we're family and it works for us. And um, in the end for us, it all averages out because I'm paying for one and she's paying for one and it allows us both to have access to both things, which is what we want. Um, Judith is asking, wants to jump back to social media and is asking what is Messenger on Facebook? Do you wanna answer that Charlie or you want me to? You can answer that, I have no idea. Okay, so Messenger on Facebook is basically the Facebook version of chat. I'm sorry, is the Facebook version of text messaging. So if you know how to text message on your phone, it's basically the same thing as text messaging, only you don't have the person's phone number, um, you have their Facebook profile. So there's a little button um, that allows you to um, chat with them and Messenger is basically just their chat function. Um, and so if someone, you know, I message with a lot of people, for example, that I went to high school and college with that I don't necessarily have their phone numbers to or want to talk to for, um, you know, general communication, but I have a specific question about X, Y, or Z. I have a question about a phone and they work in a phone company. So I want to ask them. So it's a way to keep in contact with people um, and talk with them without having their um, direct contact information. Charlie's looking at me and laughing because who would want to ask a question about a phone these days, right? Um, we got a question on, can you Zoom, get Zooms on TV instead of computer? Uh, you can, as, as we're recording this one, you can look at the recording uh, because you can look at it on YouTube because uh, that's where we will post this, this thing. So you could look at the YouTube on your smart TV because you can look at YouTube on your TV. You can't zoom on your TV because your TV has no camera or speaker. You cannot interact with your TV unless you just throw something at it. But uh, so... Uh, if it's recorded, you can do your Zoom on, you can, you can, most of them are going on YouTube because that's just, uh, it's cheap, it's device of choice and everyone does it. So that's where you'll find it. <laughs> the other option you can do if you're really motivated, although I don't know why in the world you would want to Zoom from your TV, to be honest, it's just like an open can of worms. Um, you can connect your computer or your iPad to your TV and do it that way. But again, there's no real reason or benefit to doing it that way, unless you, for some reason, need to see a giant screen, like you have a 50 inch TV and your computer is only 14 inches. Um, but there is absolutely no reason you would need to zoom from your TV. <laughs> we have uh, one question. On, they want to know the duo, how to spell duo. It's D-U-O. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's a couple questions about Gmail and we didn't get into any different email platforms. There's a zillion different email platforms. And can you create files on Gmail? And what's the purpose of using 
labels on Gmail. So jumping into the email question for a second, um, the labels in Gmail are just a way to categorize and organize your files. So they're like folders basically. And so there, if you were to create a label that says Charlie's home in Boston, anything that was related to his home in Boston, he could put that label on and then he could bring up very easily all of the emails that have to do with that or that are labeled that. Um, so it's just simply a filing system. Um, you cannot create an actual file like a Microsoft Word document or an Excel document or anything like that. Gmail is just used for emails. Um, you would need to use a different thing um, like I said, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, whatever you're trying to do in order to create a file. Um, and then you could attach that file into an email, send it via Gmail, but um, you wouldn't actually create a file within Gmail itself. Okay. Um, go ahead, Charlie. The, someone, uh, Dina talks about uh, connecting your laptop or tablet to the uh, TV, which is absolutely what you, you just use your TV as a second monitor is all you're doing there. Uh, to find people on, uh, certainly on, uh, I assume it's the same way in WhatsApp, there's a search button and you type in their name and you hit return and you'll get everyone whose name you've at, typed in. Absolutely. And on WhatsApp and Facebook, um, if you have people's emails in your preferred email, so say you use Gmail most often and you sign up for your Facebook account with your Gmail account, um, using that as your login, it's gonna go through your address book, it will connect them. And this is back to Charlie's thing about privacy. You might not want it to have access, so then you need to create a separate email, but um, it's gonna go through and say, you have a hundred email addresses listed in your Gmail address book. 75 of them has Facebook profiles, would you like to be friends with these people? And you can click yes or no. So a lot of the times it will do that. WhatsApp is the same. Um, you know, it does it based on phone number and based on email and everything is linked and interconnected. Um, so it'll ask you if you want to. Um, but again, you can just click, there's a little magnifying glass at the top of Facebook and at the corner of WhatsApp, you would just um, type that and type the person's name. Now the challenge is, is if you have a John Smith, right? there's 85 million different John Smiths. So you need to make sure you get the right one, um, which is why it's very useful to upload a picture so that people can see that they're searching the right person. Um, because again, if I request Charlie and I don't have a profile and he doesn't necessarily recognize my name, he's not gonna click yes, even if he knows me because he doesn't recognize me. So it's useful to have um, some sort of contextual information that people can use to identify you um, if you're comfortable with that. Uh, someone wants to make room on their Gmail account. These are accounts that you've, these are probably apps on your phone, uh, I assume as, is the question. And you just uh, delete the messages and empty your trash. It's really the only way to do it. Delete your promotions and your spam as well. You know, oh, yeah. you're, especially for Gmail, you're going to get a ton of spam. And what's nice about Gmail is that it automatically filters it for you. So you may not even know that you have 2000 messages sitting in your spam folder or your promotions folder in Gmail. Um, Marta from the Boston Public Library says that if you are interested in learning more about Gmail or Google Drive, um, the BPL is offering free online classes. So go to the bpl.org slash events website and we'll send that out in a follow-up email to you um, to, for more tutorials. And those will be more specific tutorials on this is exactly how you send an email in Gmail, those types of things, um, which is really nice. Um, we are approaching the end of our time together. We have about five, 10 minutes left. Does anyone have any other questions? Amazing that we've gotten through them all so fast, Charlie. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe we didn't answer them. <laughs> maybe we didn't. No? All right. Well, if people don't have any other questions, we'll give it another minute or two, um, but we will close up. Um, I know Beacon Hill Village has a number of fabulous programs uh, coming up and um, Gina will come on the screen in just a moment and announce those. Um, 
the Vilna has some fabulous programs coming up next week. We have an incredible program on Monday evening with two doctors from Mass General who have spent the last year on the COVID floors and been really instrumental in helping to save um, a lot of people who have come down with COVID. So they'll be sharing their stories. And this is really um, a tribute to all first responders um, and to hear about um, what's actually truly happening on the ground. Um, other programs that we have coming up, which we're really excited about, we have a program about what it's like to be an other um, and Jews of color, um, facilitated by a wonderful spoken word artist, Vanessa Hideri out of New York. And um, she's gonna be talking a lot about um, being the other within your community, which is a, a wonderful topic. We have a book, author Tally Karner, um, who is a wonderful author. She wrote a book about sex trafficking um, from Russia to South America in the 19th century. And she is joining us on March 11th. So we will hope you will join us for that as well. Um, and lastly, um, we are doing on March 9th, a wonderful, wonderful uh, photography online exhibition with Peter Vanderwalker, who some of you may recognize. He's a local Boston photographer, very well known. And he's gonna be doing a series on we all know Boston is historic, here's why. And showing pictures, you know, then and now, which is really fascinating and telling some of the tales of, um, of you know, historic Boston. Um, in a moment, Gina will hop on screen, um, but I have a survey and Beacon Hill Village has a survey we would love for you to fill out. If you don't mind let us, letting us know what you think of this um, program, we'd love to hear your opinion and your voice so that we can shape um, in the future um, and let you know, uh, make sure we're programming for what you want. So here's the survey link in the chat. We'll also email it to you uh, later today or tomorrow with the reporting. Um, and without further ado, Gina, it's over to uh, you. Gina, we have a, I have one, one answer. Somebody asked about being hacked. Uh, and it's, the really only thing you can do about being hacked is have strong passwords and different passwords. And so I would recommend that you get a password manager is, is probably the best way to avoid being hacked. Uh, but if somebody hacks into Yahoo or AOL and steals everyone's passwords, there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you, Charlie. On that positive note, as you pass it, that pass the baton over to me. Hi, everybody, and thank you both. That was fun. I think I, you know, I, I took some notes on some of those things because I'm not up to date on everything. So my name is Gina Peglusha Morrison, and I'm the executive director at Beacon Hill Village. And I'll start by answering a question, which is Eileen is asking: Are we a housing project? or do people live in their own homes? So we're a virtual village. Yeah, we don't have, uh, we don't have a physical building or a residence. 20 years ago, um, we started out just in Beacon Hill. So neighbors in Beacon Hill created the village to stay in their own homes as they grew older, but we really cover pretty much downtown Boston. And if you think about you know, where we are, where we have members, all the way out to Fenway, um, the south end, the west end, the north end, the waterfront, back bay to the river. So we're downtown Boston virtual village, but um, we're a membership organization and many of our programs um, are for members, but we do have um, some interesting ones coming up in March, which are open to everyone. So I'm gonna tell you about them, but I would invite people to go to beaconhillvillage.org and current calendar, and you can see all the various things that we are doing, but coming up, just next week, if you can believe it's March on Monday, but March 3rd, Wednesday, um, we bring in musicians and Sharon Isbin is a classical guitarist, very well known. We're so thrilled to have her. Um, so the programs that you'll find that are open to the public means that you could visit our website and actually register and sign up for them. You can give the office a call. 617-723-9713. And you could say, oh, I heard about your music salon. I really love to attend. Um, we can register for, uh, you for that program. So I point everybody to our online calendar. Some big things coming up is that music salon. Uh, second one is we have a program in partnership with the BPL. Pre-COVID, we would have uh, lectures in the Commonwealth Salon in Copley, location of the library, where we would bring in just specialists across every healthcare topic you could imagine. We would gather in person. 
So we partnered with a library for that physical location. Um, as you can imagine, like you, the Vilna, we're all virtual. And on March 9th, uh, we're doing a program. Uh, Judy Foreman's written a book. The topic is called Exercises Medicine. Um, she's a, a brilliant uh, woman to listen to, a lot of information. And the Living Well, Ending Well program series is really all about health and wellness. And we cover things like um, cancer topics, you know, if you think about the different uh, cardio care, bone health, we've done eye care, we'll do coming up is going to be the ex-CEO of Dana Farber. he'll have new uh, developments in cancer. So lots of wonderful things that Living Well, Ending Well program again is virtual, always been open to the public, hopefully someday we'll be back in Copley and you can come and see those programs in person. And Karen, who's our program chair, you met in the beginning. I'm, I'm speaking to her now saying, Karen, are there any other that I should be highlighting of, um, maybe we can open up Karen as well. I think Karen was bumped down to our participants. She was bumped down, okay. <laughs> so um, I think those are kind of the key things coming up, but we, let's see, how is Virtual Village connected to Vilna? Wow, so we have, um, you met Eva Jean in the beginning, who's an amazing member of both organizations. So she's one connector. We, our village is just reaching out to create friends, if you want to call it, and really simply to other organizations. We reached out to Lynn and said, we would love to do a program together and we hope we do many more, but we're just um, neighbors in the neighborhood, if you will. We share some common missions about bringing information and community and engagement. And this was a way for us to get together and share, um, do a joint program. And we hope you both, everyone will come to both organizations, um, both virtually and in person when we are both able to gather again. Absolutely. Wonderful. So without further ado, we will um, end this and thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good week. Thanks everybody. Take care. Yeah. Bye.